This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. I'm not promising any of you that you're going to get rich by tithing. I'm not. I'm going to promise you that if you give God the first, it's the right thing to do, that he'll redeem the rest. But only that which is given away can be expanded. And the truth is that God knows your motivation, and you can't fool God. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder You bring the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Fines. My name's Aaron, and you're listening to Today with Jeff Fines. Welcome back to the program. Last time we started a message to understand a person's true wealth. If you missed it, you can find it on all major platforms. Just search for Today with Jeff Fines. But for now, Pastor Jeff is taking us through the rest of this message. We'll be looking at Jesus' miracles as he shows us that only that which is given away can be multiplied. Now, 5,000 men, the reason it says men is because it's trying to tell you there's about 15 to 20,000 people there. If you include men, women, children, there's going to be, and nobody knows exactly, and I don't assume to know exactly. I'm just telling you it's a logical deduction, a pretty wise guess to say that the total crowd probably was around 15 to 20,000 people, including men, women, and children. Now, the thing about Jesus is he gets going and he preaches without any notes at all. He's pretty good. And he's able just to go on and on and on for eternity. No pun intended. He could just go on and on and on. And so he's preaching. starts about 9 o'clock. It's noon. It's lunchtime. He's still going. People haven't eaten anything. The disciples and their associates are kind of stirred. They're kind of a little bit frustrated with what's happening. Jesus keeps going, man. Doesn't even break for tea time or lunch. It's 3 o'clock now. It's about 4 o'clock. And the associates, the disciples, start talking among themselves about what's going on here. And they say something like, uh, hey, you know what? Somebody better go tell Jesus to chill because it's nearing five o'clock and all the restaurants are going to be closed. No McDonald's on the way home. These people are hungry. They've not eaten anything. He better dismiss them and send them home so they can stop at the restaurants and get something to eat before it's too late. So let's say they chose Peter. I don't know which one they chose. Just one went to Jesus. So he goes up to Jesus and imagine what would happen. Jesus in the middle of speaking. He's been up there like for seven, eight hours. The whole audience is intrigued and he kind of taps him on the shoulder, probably says, "Uh, can I speak with you just a moment? And he says, Jesus, you're doing a great job. I've been taking notes and listening. It's a good sermon. It's long. You guys think I'm long? Eight hours. He goes on. But Jesus, you got to chill, man. You got to send these guys home because they haven't eaten. And McDonald's and Burger King are going to be closed like in a half hour. So you got to send them home so they'll have something. They haven't eaten all day. And you know, an unruly crowd, a hungry crowd won't be good. And so Jesus looks at him and he basically says this. No, you feed them. So he goes back to the disciples. Jesus continues preaching. Disciples say, what does he say? He said, he said for us to feed him. Now, what do they do at that point? They do what most of us do. They start scrounging through the crowd, trying to find enough food to feed the crowd, which makes no sense at all to me. If there's enough food to feed the crowd, why gather it? Just let them feed themselves. And evidently, let's say it was Peter. He goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, man, this is all I found. And he thinks Jesus is going to say, that's all you got. Hey, we better send him home before McDonald's closes. But he doesn't do that. He says, good. Now, here's what I want you to do. And I consider this to be the first miracle that's not mentioned or that we talk about. Jesus says, you divide 20,000 people up into groups of 50. Can you see 12 men dividing 20,000 people up into groups of 50? That's a miracle in and of itself. But they managed to do it. And then here's what happens according to the text. And it happens in this order. And it's important that you see this. Jesus takes the bread that the disciples collected and gave to Jesus, brought to Jesus. Jesus takes it and he blesses it. Then he breaks it, and then he gives it to the disciples, and the disciples give it to the people. Now stay with me for a moment. This is where the first principle comes into place. Something must be blessed 
Something must be blessed before it can multiply. You with me? Something must be blessed before it can multiply. Now, again, Jesus takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it, gives it to the disciples, and the disciples start to give it out. But it has not been multiplied yet. You understand? The miracle was not where Jesus says, okay, let it be done, and then there's all this food. No, 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 no. He gives the one piece of bread broken, and he says, okay, feed the crowd of 5,000. You know what happens in the end, right? They collect 12 baskets filled with food. But it's important to notice how the miracle occurs. Now, I say this first part because last week we talked about the very first fruits of our lives are holy, consecrated, set apart for God. So until we bring the first portions of our life, whatever it is, to God, it cannot be blessed. And it cannot multiply until it's been blessed. And the only way it can be blessed is if it's brought to God. Are you with me? So the first fruits, first portions, whatever it is, your time, your talents, whatever it is, you give that to God, then God blesses it, and then it has the potential to multiply, but it doesn't multiply yet. Let me rephrase. I need to make sure we understand. This is the first step. Something must be blessed before it can multiply, and something can only be blessed when it's given to Jesus. Now, here's the second principle. And there are only two, and we're already to the second one. Here's it is. Only what is given away can be multiplied. Only what is blessed can be multiplied. Only what is given to Jesus can be blessed. And only what is given away can then be multiplied. Now, this is so important. If you look at the story... Jesus gives the disciples the bread, but the multiplication doesn't happen until they actually start actively giving away what Jesus has blessed beforehand. You with me? The Bible says in Luke 19, Luke 9, verse 16, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. Now the question is, distribute what? He just broke a piece of bread in half and gave it to them. There's been no overflowing of multiplication. And then one disciple would break it and give it to another disciple and then break it. And every time they gave it away, guess what happened? It multiplied. Do you see? It did not multiply until they started to give it away. Now I can see the look in your eyes, so I've got a little demonstration for you. Here's what we give God. Now it could be anything. All right, see how small it is? Let's put it in this glass right here. This could be anything. This could be your time, the first fruits of your talents, the first fruits of your ability, the first fruits of your thinking, the first fruits of your money. It could be anything. And it looks pretty small, doesn't it? And you bring that to God and an amazing thing happens. God pours his spirit out upon it because of the promise he's made and nothing happens at first. And then it just gets out of control. <laughs> then it just starts exploding and growing and growing and expanding. Remember how little it was when we started? Remember? And now look how much is there. Look at this. It's still growing. And then you try to put it in. The, I mean, that's about what we started with. And now look, it overflows. The principle is simple. Only that which is given away does God promise to expand. The miracle happens in the feeding of the 5,000 as each disciple by faith gives away what he thinks is not enough. He gives it away, it multiplies. He gives it away, it multiplies. Then they all go and give it away and it multiplies and it multiplies. So much so, it gets out of control and then they collect 12 baskets filled, overflowed more than they needed to feed 20,000 people. Now, this is so important, man. I want to make sure you get this. Only that which is given away can multiply. I want to show you a photo of somebody. This is Clyde and Wanda Buckles. Clyde was kind of like my youth pastor when I was a kid. Now, we had a church, and I told you in my church, we talked about sin 52 times a year. Every week, the sermon was on sin. That doesn't mean it didn't have some good people in it. This was a good guy. He and his wife, they were farmers. He prayed for sons, never got one, got three daughters. A gentle giant. This guy lived his life but for one purpose, that people who are far from God would come near. He was a farmer, guys. He didn't have a lot of money. But the guy gave so much stuff away. My favorite time of the month, I grew up in a poor family, and in 1976, we got our first McDonald's in my hometown. And it's big stuff, but we never got to go. Because we couldn't afford it. Dad couldn't take four sons and wife and our appetites, so we never got to go. He didn't have the money to go either. But once a month at youth group, you know what he'd do? Whether he had it or not, go down and just buy like 30 cheeseburgers and french fries and milkshakes. The only time I got soda then when I was young was when I went to Uncle Clyde's for youth group. This guy was such a giver. The thing about it was, and I didn't see it until later in life, 
he never seemed to be without. He didn't make a lot of money, but he always seemed to have plenty. But he always seemed to keep giving things away. And it's his life that I go back to and remember. This guy, the more he gave away, the more God expanded what little he had. I, I, I just want you to see, folks, and this is, this is going to hurt a little, but you're going to let me explain. Tithing is not giving. It's returning. You see? When you give a tithe to God, it's not giving. You're simply returning what is rightfully his. It's bringing back to the Lord what belongs to him. Otherwise, if it didn't belong to him, how could God accuse his people of robbing him? You can only rob somebody if it belongs to him. It belongs to him. The first portions of all of our life, yes, including our finance, belongs to him. It's rightfully his. That's why tithing is not giving, it's returning. It's returning back to God what is rightfully his. And the Bible says in Luke 16, you want a New Testament passage where Jesus is talking. He says, and if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, if you look carefully, when God's talking about you can't serve both God and mammon, the point of this verse is, if you're not faithful with God, he's the other man. If you're not faithful with the stuff that he's given you, how do you expect him to give you what is your own? So God doesn't expand your resources if you're not faithful in the resources he's already given and your faithfulness is bringing back to God what rightfully belongs to him. Now, here's what I believe. Stay with me now. It's not over. It'll become clear. I believe here's what God does in our lives. There are seasons of our lives when he sends us a little extra to see what we'll do with it. And if I get that little extra in my life and I go spend it all on myself, then God knows and so do you. Man, I can't be trusted with a little. Why would God trust me with a lot? See, folks, how many of you last week when I started talking thought, great, Pastor Jeff's finally going to give me a formula to get rich? <laughs> See, if that was your thought, guess what? It's still not about God. It's about you still. See, if you use God to get more money to spend on yourself, God's not first. It's still about you. I've had people come up to me as a pastor and say, Pastor Jeff, I'm getting ready to sell a house. And I want to sell it right at the top of the market and get the highest price. You pray for that, I'm going to give to the church. I would tell you what I think when somebody tells me that, but I'm not going to do that. I'll have somebody come to me and say, Pastor Jeff, I've got some stock. It's, you know, it's doing really well. Pray that God keeps it right there because if it does, I'm going to give a lot of money to the church. My favorite was when a guy came to me probably four months ago and said, I'm about ready to go on a game show. <laughs> I want you to pray that God give me the right answer at the right time. And I'll tell you, if I win a lot of money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna give to it, give it to the, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> I never see those people again. Because God's response to you is this. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. If you're not faithful now, what makes you think you're going to be faithful when I give you a lot? Does God want to bless your finances? Yes. Does God want to multiply your finances? Yes, but not for you. <laughs> not for your purposes. For his. For his. So that's why I can honestly say, I believe that God wants to shift the cattle on a thousand hills your way if he can trust you to use it for his purposes, not yours. Think about Zacchaeus for a moment. Zacchaeus is changed by the grace of God. He was amazed that Jesus, the rabbi, wanted to come to his house. And what does Zacchaeus learn that just makes him all excited? He learns that it's not about law. It's about grace. And he's so overwhelmed with Jesus' mercy and grace. Remember the two things he does? Number one, he says, I'm going to give 50% of everything I have away. And why would he do that? The Mosaic law only required 10 and he's just learned that it's not on the basis of law that God accepts you. So all of a sudden, does he stand up and say, I'm going to give 50% to the poor. And the reason is, and I want you to memorize this, is because grace inspires much more than the law ever required. See, some of you get hung up on these sermons and you think, well, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. No, you're missing the point. When Jesus has truly changed your heart, it's not about you having to. It's about you being inspired to. Because you know that Jesus didn't tithe his life. He gave it all. And if you want the New Testament example for giving, it's not the tithe. It's ultimately everything. 
Jesus gave it all that the world, those who were far from God might come near. And the call on your and my life, we get stuck on the law or obedience. Grace inspires more than the law ever required. The second thing he says I'm going to do, I'm going to give four times back to anybody I stole from. Again, the Mosaic law only required twice back. He says four. Why? Because something happens when you meet the Savior. And here's what it is. Greed surrenders to generosity at the point of conversion. So says Tim Keller. Something happens in you. When you see Jesus dying to make you his treasure, then other people will become yours. Now stay with me. I didn't always believe this or live this. When I was in seminary, Robin and I were very poor. I mean, you know what it's like. Remember the college days? Oh, my goodness. We were trying not to take out student loans. We were working, but we could barely make ends meet. And I remember coming home from seminary one day, and I pulled off the exit to turn right to go to our apartments, and I looked down to the left, and under a bridge was a homeless guy, and he had a little sign holding. Now, here's what I said to God. Now, see, I'm not as dumb as most of you think I am. I'm not. I've been in Africa, and so when I see guys like this, my first inclination is your first inclination. This guy's running a scam right? That's what you think too. But I try to listen to the voice of the Lord, try to have a prompting to listen because you can get to the point where you're cynical and you never help anybody, especially those who really need it. And I could sense God saying to me, it's not an audible voice, but I could sense God saying, go help him. Oh God, I don't want to do that. Go help God. We don't have, I don't, what am I going to help him with? Go help him. I pull over to the left. I pull under the bridge, roll down the window. Hey, man, how can I help you? And I wanted him to say something like, I need some money. Because then I'd know. He didn't do that. He said, dude, man, I got three kids. I need some food. I don't want money. I'm not an alcohol. I'm not a drinker. I just want some food. Can you help me? Get in. I took him up to Kroger, which is a popular food chain there. And I, uh, I bought $120 right around there. I can't remember the exact number, but it's right around there, groceries. Put them in the bags. Tears in his eyes, he thanked me, and he went, went on his way. On the way home, it's like God said to me, hey, hey, how do you feel right now? You feel pretty good, don't you? Well, yeah, I do. It's kind of, you feel kind of alive, don't you? Well, yeah, I kind of do. You feel kind of scared too, don't you? Yeah, I do, Lord, because I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. You're a little frightened, aren't you? I'm terrified, God. Are you, you love watching me squirm or what? I said, I like, I like what you're frightened of me. I, I said, God, I, I wouldn't be frightened if you'd just give me some money right now. <laughs> so I go back. Now, this, I don't have a bunch of stories to tell you like this, and I don't want you to feel manipulated at all. Not every story turns out like this, but this one did, and of course, that's why I used it. The next day, I got a check in the mail for the exact amount. That's all I remember. For an article I had written for a journal that I didn't even know I was going to get paid for, and I just thought, wow. And God said to me, how'd you like that? I said, that was pretty cool. And he said, you think you can trust me from here on out? And that was kind of a red letter day in my life. And here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. In those seasons of my life that God sends me a little extra, if I spend all that extra on my pleasure, he stopped sending. James tells us, you have not because you ask not, or you ask that you might spend it on your own selfish pleasures. But if he sends me extra, and I say, man, how can I use this to advance Christ's kingdom? You know what happens? It seems to just keep expanding and expanding and expanding as I give it away. You see what I'm saying? I'm not promising any of you that you're going to get rich by tithing. I'm not. I'm going to promise you that if you give God the first, it's the right thing to do, that he'll redeem the rest. But only that which is given away can be expanded. And the truth is that God knows your motivation. And you can't fool God. And at that moment in your life when your heart becomes, God, I want to be used to expand your kingdom. So expand my time and my talents and my finances. And God, I'll use that to do what's really important. See, when that clicks in your mind, something will happen. And greed will surrender to generosity at the point of that conversion. Somebody said it, and I wish I knew who. I can't find it anywhere. But a man's true wealth is not in what he keeps, but in what he gives away. 
Now, here's what I want you to do. You, you were given a card when you came in. It should have been in your bulletin or somewhere. It looks like this. I want you to take it out. Don't worry, you're safe. By the way, while you're finding that, can I ask you something? Did I mention that you're saved? Did I mention that? Did I mention that your salvation is based on Jesus and what he did? Did I mention that this message was not about your salvation, you keeping it or losing it? Did I mention that? It's important that you remember that. Otherwise, in sermons like this, you're going to feel manipulated. This is not about your salvation. Do you understand? You're safe, secure. You walk out of here with a smile on your face. This is about God using you for his purposes and you feeling alive again. And you're feeling that thrill of trusting God and watching him expand your time, your talents, your resources, whatever it is. There's a card that you have. I'm going to ask you not to put your name on it, but to put something on that line of what you're going to offer to God. It might be, I'm going to offer, I'm already tithing my time to God. And some of you always tell me that. You'll say, hey, I'm tithing my time. Hey, it's not right to obey in one area and disobey in another. But if you're tithing your time, then I'm saying, maybe you can offer more of your time a little bit somewhere and see if God will expand it. How does God expand time? That would be cool. Well, I'm talking about those of you who know that when you come in the first of your day and you honor God with the first fruits, isn't it amazing how many hours, how the time goes, how you just click and things go better. You get more things done in a short because you've honored God. I'm saying that some of you can offer your time. Together. Some of you, it can be your talent. You've got a certain talent. You know would expand Christ's kingdom. Write that down. Don't put your name. This is between you and God, but I want you to put it in the offering thing as it comes around. Now, some of you, let me go back. Some of you are not even given the first fruits of your time, your talents, or your monies. I would hope that after last week's message that you would have made that decision. Next week is the first of the month. That you would, that'd be a great time for you to start giving God the first fruits of time, talents, and resources. But if you're doing that in any other area of your life, this is about your offering. This is about what you give and you ask God to expand. Don't put your name on it. For some, it might be dollars. You want God to expand to trust you. It might be you're going to offer your time in some area of ministry. You're going to offer your talent. Whatever it is, write it down on that. Write it down. And let's see if God will expand that area of your life. Now, just let me make sure that we're on the same page. My hope is in, my trust is in, my future is in, that's right. And once we really take that on board and we really believe it, your relationship to everything else in your life will change, I promise. And I want to give you a little exercise to take that step of faith. And the offering bags come around. It's part of our service today. So I'm going to ask the ushers to keep those back doors left. Nobody gets to leave after my prayer. This is still part of our worship service. This is still part of our offering to God. Father, I thank you so much for the power of your word in this passage, and I pray right now in Jesus' name that our eyes would have been open. I pray that everything that I said that is consistent with your word would be taken in, would change lives. Anything that I've said that is not consistent, Father, I pray that it would just kind of fade away like dust. It would just disappear, dissipate. Father, I pray for everyone in the room right now that they would consider the idea that grace inspires so much more than the law ever required, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, and he is our ultimate example of a life well lived. And I pray right now as we surrender everything to you, that we'll step out on faith and say, God, I offer this part of my life to you in hopes that you will expand it, in hopes that I can use it for your kingdom, the thing that is unshakable and eternal, and the thing that ultimately matters most. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Finds wherever you listen to podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will bring this offering You are my wonder, you bring the wonder
today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.